Well, praise the Lord. It's good to see you all this morning. And uh, from the front here, you might, you sound like you're all in good voice this morning. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Oh, I love to be in the presence of God. I've really felt a wonderful uh, spirit in the worship this morning, and it's just wonderful. Praise his name. Well, as Robert said this morning, we're coming around the word of God now. This is our teaching meeting this morning. This evening, a shorter sermon tonight, and it'll be, there's something in it for Christians and something in it for not yet Christians, all right? And uh, a totally different um, sermon than this morning's. But I felt very much in my heart over recent weeks, and particularly as we came to uh, Pentecost, um, that I really feel that somehow we need to, there are certain things in the Bible that are fundamental to our faith. And what I want to do this morning is I'd like to turn your attention to one verse of Scripture. And what I want to do this morning, and I don't want you to be put off, I want you to be all attentive. Because this morning, if I mention the word doctrinal, most of you go to sleep. Or if I mention the word theological, most of you even sleep longer. But you know, friends, there are certain things that are fundamental to our faith. And I felt my heart being led to a scripture for this morning. And we're going to find the scripture in the first book of John, chapter 5. First book of John, chapter 5. And we're going to read... <coughs> from verse 7. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and this is our text now that we're coming to, and these three are one. And these three, that's the Father, the Word, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, these three are one. So let's just pray together, shall we? And unite our hearts before the Lord. Father in heaven, we just pray that now you would send the Holy Spirit in a very real manner to open the eyes of our understanding and to put the truth within our hearts. Lord, give us help, give us wisdom, so that nothing that is said this morning would rob you of any glory. Lord, we just want your name to be exalted, and we want to see you as you are. So, Lord, help us to know today, in a greater, in a deeper, and in a fuller way, yourself, we pray. And we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, what we're considering this morning is one of the greatest and the most vital doctrines of all truths in all of God's word. And that is the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, as I said to you, sometimes we're afraid of the word doctrine. Or we're afraid of the word theology. But theology is very simply the study of God. And everything related to our lives, everything related to our Christian beliefs and practices must have a theological basis. And we can and must endeavor to be doctrinally correct, rightly dividing the word of truth. And if there's one doctrine that is vital and fundamental to the Christian faith, it's the doctrine of the Trinity. One theologian actually said 
The doctrine of the Trinity is basic to Christianity. And the whole of Christianity either stands with it or falls with it. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, the doctrine of the Trinity is the differentiating doctrine of the Christian faith. Without the doctrine, you see, of the Trinity, we do not have a Christian faith. Because the Christian faith stands or falls with this very important doctrine. Another theologian said, the Trinity is the basis of the gospel, and the gospel is the declaration of the Trinity in action. Now, 1 John 5 verse 7, in my opinion, is the clearest reference in the whole of Scripture to the doctrine of the Trinity. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, that's Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Now, there are many other clear references, but I believe that this verse is the most wonderful that gives us a, a synopsis of the Trinity. And the interesting thing about this particular verse is that many, but not all, but many of the modern versions either omit this verse or they put a footnote somewhere below this verse to call into question the authority of this verse. And that is an absolute fundamental error to suggest that this verse is either non-inspired or that it's not important. Now, it has to be granted this morning that the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. But the truth of the Trinity is found in every part of the Bible. These three are one. And so in knowing God, in knowing Christ as our Savior, what we are saying as we know him as Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so our subject this morning is the Trinity of God. And there are five things that I want to say this morning in reference to the doctrine of the Trinity. And the first is this. We're going to define the doctrine of the Trinity. You see, the word Trinity is a Latin word, which means three in one, or one which is three, and it can also be rendered three which are one. So right in that statement, in our text this morning, we have the doctrine of the Trinity defined. These three are one. Now, the Bible makes it abundantly clear that there is only one God. God is one, and yet God is a unity, but God is one. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord... Our Lord, I'm sorry, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. So God is one. And along comes that thought that there is, that if, there's only, if our God is one, there is only one God. Now, that thought clearly runs through scripture. For example, in Isaiah chapter 43, and verse 10, at the end of the verse, it says, and this is God talking, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. So before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. And friends, if, that's, if there's one verse that knocks the faith of the Mormons on its head, it's that verse. Before me, there was no God formed, 
nor shall there be after me. And yet the Mormon religion, in a nutshell, says what man is, God once was, and what God is, man may become, in a nutshell. And yet this verse of scripture says, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be any other after me. So God is one. So we're establishing that. I know you know this basically, but still it's very important in this day and age because even in evangelical circles, people are going away from the truths of the scripture. And I'll tell you why in a bit. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 says these words. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So at the same time, as he's the only God, he's the one God, he's not one God amongst many gods, as we will be told today by many people, but he's the one true and living God. Now, James chapter 2 and verse 19 says this you believe that there is one god you do well even the demons believe and tremble so thank god there's not a demon there's not a devil there's not an evil spirit that believes in more than one god the devil knows that there's only one God. All the demonic spirits know that there's only one God. And the Bible says they tremble. And so why is it then that they propagate this lie of polytheism that there is more than one God? Now, this one God is revealed, according to our text this morning, in three distinct persons, the Father, the Word, or the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, friends, it's three distinct persons. Sometimes the Bible uses the title, the Godhead. Sometimes it calls it the divine nature. We read that, for instance, in Acts chapter 17 and in verse 29. Let me just read that verse to you. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's desiring. So he calls it the, the divine nature. Now, when you come to the book of Colossians, in chapter 2 and verse 9, it says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So the term Godhead. And you'll not get a better description of the Trinity than, and we don't follow, particularly refer to this very often, but... Years ago, they, they brought in the old Westminster Confession of Faith. Some of you will know, know what that is. And it says in there, in the, in the unity of the Godhead, there is three persons of one substance, one power, and eternity. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons, not three gods. One God in three persons, and they are distinguished by their personal properties. One in three and three in one. So that's the doctrine defined. Then we come secondly to the doctrine demanded, because this is a doctrine that God demands, folks. We live in a generation today of liberalism, and very sadly, in the 21st century, we are living in, a, in a, a period of what I call easy believism. 
And I've heard modern Christians and even some church leaders say, well, we don't preach on those things because the doctrine's archaic. I've heard Christians say, well, it's outdated. It's not really important. So long as you believe in the God, so long as you believe in Jesus and you've asked him to be your saviour, it doesn't matter how you put the whole thing together. It doesn't really matter how you equate Jesus to the Godhead. It's unimportant as long as I believe in Jesus. But friends, let me tell you, if you don't believe in the Jesus that is one in three, you've not got the right Jesus. Norman Vincent Peale, who wrote that bestseller, The Power of Positive Thinking, he said in his book, any faith is better than no faith. And you know, that's the type of attitude that a lot of Christians have today. Any faith is better than no faith. And it's rife in the evangelical movement. It's rife in Pentecostal churches. And they've all adopted this idea, well, it's better to have some faith rather than not to have no faith at all. But friends, let me tell you, you can believe the wrong thing. And that will not do you any good at all. Because if you're wrong about God, and you're wrong about Jesus Christ, and you're wrong about the Trinity, you are lost. 2, Corinthians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And verse 6 says this, But we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from any brother who walks disorderly, and not according to the tradition that you received from us. And 1 Timothy 6, verses 3 to 5 says this, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes, arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. Paul is saying that if any man teaches a different doctrine about God, he describes what kind of man that would be. And at the end, he says, from such, withdraw yourself. In other words, doctrine is so vital, so fundamental, so important that Paul is actually saying, if anybody teaches any different, have nothing to do with them, spiritually speaking, because there's no ground of fellowship when somebody denies the doctrine of Christ or somebody denies the doctrine of the Godhead or what we find in Holy Spirit Scripture. And notice Paul calls it the doctrine which accords with godliness. And he describes men as those who suppose that godliness is a means of gain if they don't subscribe to the doctrine. So to deny the Trinity is to deny who and what God really is. And God requires us to know him as Trinity. Even if we can't understand it all, even if we can't get it all together, it's vital that we know that this is what we believe it, that we know it's what the Bible teaches, and the Bible is our sole rule for faith and practice. We must believe it. John Wesley said this, tell me how in this room, he said, there are three candles, but just one light, and I'll explain the doctrine of the Trinity. It was one of the old Puritans that said, we can no more comprehend the Trinity than a nutshell can hold all the water of the oceans. Someone else said to try and understand the Trinity 
could result in us losing our minds, but at the same time, to deny the Trinity would result in us losing our very souls. So we have the doctrine defined, the doctrine demanded. Thirdly, the doctrine denied. Never has a Bible doctrine so much come under attack as this one. And if this doctrine is denied, then there's a real danger connected with it. Historically, in the first, second and third centuries after the New Testament church, this doctrine was denied by a lot of people. They followed certain philosophers, certain teachers, and they call themselves Arians, uh, Sicinians, and there was another title as well, but different groups that denied the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, let me tell you something. We're in 2021, but their influence is still here today. And people started to question the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they started to question the whole work of redemption as well. That's how these sects, as we know them, have been formed. The Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the Unitarians, the Christadelphians, the Christian scientists, Armstrongism, the Church of God, the Way International. And sadly, I've got to say that even within Pentecostal so-called circles, there are a group of people, we don't see them so much in this part of the country, but they've come from usually black countries or America, and within our cities, they've got some quite well-attended churches. There's one in Manchester, there's others in Nottingham, there are more than one in Manchester. And there are a group of people that are called, really, they call themselves the Oneness Pentecostals. Very often, they go under the name the United Pentecostal Church. The Oneness Pentecostals. And they talk about the Jesus only movement. And they say, there's one God revealed in three persons, but those three persons are the same person. Let me say that again. See how subtle the enemy is. There's one God revealed in three persons, but those three persons are the same person. In other words, what they're saying is that the Father is the same person as the Son. And the Son is the same person as the Holy Spirit. And they're all talking, what, it, the Trinity, what they say is, God is one person. And sometimes he appears as Father, sometimes he appears as Son, and sometimes he appears as the Holy Spirit. And that's why when they baptize people, they say we don't need to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because it's all one person anyway, so we just baptize in, say, the name of Jesus. Now, you see, friends, this is very vital. God is not... God is one God... But he is not one person that suddenly appears in different forms. He's three distinct persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not three gods, but one. Three in one and one in three. In the Bible, in the beginning, it says God created the heavens and the earth. And the word for God there is Elohim. And it's a plural word that denotes plurality. And yet at the same time, it's a singular word 
denoting one God. One God in three persons. Many times the scriptures talk about the Father is God. Many times the scripture talks about God the Father, who's almighty, all-knowing, and every and ever present. And yet at the same time, God tells us that Jesus is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. We know that verse, son to us a child is born, a son is given, the government will be upon his shoulder, his name shall we call wonderful counsellor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And then Jesus has the name Emmanuel, doesn't he? God with us as well. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 16, without controversy, he says, great is the, ministry, the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Speaking of Jesus Christ. And then... We've got to say, Jesus displayed the attributes of God. He had the names of God. And yet the Holy Spirit is God as well. Because, you know, in Acts chapter 5, when Ananias and Sapphira um, had to be disciplined, the Lord, for keeping part of the money back, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? So the Holy Spirit takes the God, is God there. Now, it's very important because wherever you go in the Bible, the Bible speaks about the Father, it speaks about the Son, and it speaks about the Holy Spirit. Three persons, and yet one. Three in one. But they're all distinct. So it's not some God manifesting himself in three different forms. All right, you must be clear on that. Now then, so we've got the doctrine defined, the doctrine demanded, the doctrine denied, the doctrine declared, and finally, the doctrine demonstrated. Now, it's very hard, perhaps, for us to understand how three persons could be one in one, and one could be in three. One in three, and three in one. Well, I don't know whether you've ever taken... Let me just, for instance, have you ever seen a shamrock? You know, a shamrock is one stem and yet it has three leaves but yet the one leaf do you understand that three leaves one stem and yet it's one leaf at the same time take an egg now you all know what an egg is don't you an egg but you've got a shell which has its own job it protects what's inside. It's the, the shell. And then you have a white of an egg. And yet a white of an egg, you can make meringues with it. You've got a yolk of an egg that you can make your posh custard with. But you only use the yolks and not the white. And for the meringues, you only use the whites and not the yolks. Or if you fry the egg with your bacon, you can have it all together. But you see, an egg, it's got a shell, it's got a white, and it's got a yolk. Three different things, but yet in one. Take an ice cube. If you threw that into a hot frying pan, the ice cube would immediately begin to melt, and some of it would begin to evaporate. 
and you would have solid, you'd have liquid, gas, and yet water. You see, its properties do not change, but its appearance changes. Chemistry, physics, biology are three different subjects, and yet you call them science. And you can't have one without the other. And one exists perfectly alongside the other. And the laws of physics, the laws of chemistry, and the laws of biology all affect the other, and yet three subjects are all one science. Three in one. Now God, when he created the heavens and the earth, said, let us make man in our own image. When God called Isaiah in chapter 6 of Isaiah's prophecy, it says in verse 8, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, now listen to this, this is important. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Who was he talking to? Who will go for us? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Colossians 1, verse 16, speaking of Christ, says this, for by him all things were created. That's Jesus. That are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities and powers, all things were created through him and for him. And yet, in Job and in uh, chapter 26, of the book of Job, in verse uh, 13, it says this. By his spirit, he adorned the heavens. His hand pierced the filling stone. By his spirit, he adorned the heavens. So we're being told that Jesus was the creator. In the beginning, God, we, we know the Father was the creator. We know from Colossians, Jesus was the creator. We know that the Holy Spirit was involved in the creation. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God and this firmament shows his handiwork, one God. And yet the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were all working together in creation. You know, the angel of the Lord, when he spoke to Mary, he said, the power of the Holy Ghost shall overshadow thee. And God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were involved in the, arcade, in the incarnation of Christ. When Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came down in bodily form like a dove. And yet the Father spoke and said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In Hebrews 9 and verse 14, we talk about the how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. My, so you've got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all mentioned in one verse. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the internal spirit offered himself without spot to God, speaking of the Father. Friends, it's very, very important because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were involved in the incarnation and they were involved in the work of the cross. The scripture tells us in Galatians that Jesus was raised by God the Father and yet in Romans, we're told that he was raised by the Spirit. And yet in John's Gospel, Jesus says, I have power to lay down my life and I have power to raise it up again. So in the resurrection, you've got the Trinity at work. 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In salvation, you've got the Trinity at work. In 1 Peter chapter 1, he, Peter writes as an apostle to the pilgrims and so on, and he says, elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So you see, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are involved if you get saved. That's why it's important to believe in the Trinity of God, because the Trinity is at work. And then with the Great Commission, what did Jesus say to the disciples? Tarry in Jerusalem until you be endured with power from on high. And he said, I will give you the promise of the Father. And so it's the Father who commissions us to preach the gospel of the Son under the power of the Holy Spirit. So in water baptism, when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit and the Father was present. And in the baptism of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, on the words of Jesus, when he said, I shall pray the Father and he shall send you another comforter, even the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit, and he shall testify of me. So the Father sent the Spirit to testify of the Son. In the gifts of the Holy Spirit sent to the church. And remember, there are gifts that are active today in the church of Jesus Christ. Gifts of the Holy Spirit. Thank God they're not a thing that died on the day of Pentecost. But they're still present in the church today. And God says there are diversities of gifts but the same spirits. There are difference of ministries, but the same Lord. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14, it says these words. Paul said at the end of his letter, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, speaking of the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, be with you all. So in giving his benediction to the church, Paul talked about Father, Son, Holy Spirit. One famous preacher said this, no human being would ever have conceived of this doctrine. It's so great and wonderful. But it comes from the Bible and nowhere else. And thank God this morning, he's revealed it to us. You see, friends, we haven't got a God like one of us. He's incomprehensible, and yet, at the same time, he's knowable. Hallelujah. So our text then, for this morning, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. For, these, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Now, folks, if anybody tells you, well, I'm not bothered about all that. I just know Jesus. Do they know the right Jesus? Because, friends, if Jesus isn't fully God and fully divine, you can't even be saved. Can't be saved because he's not done the right job. He's not paid the price for your sin. How can he have paid the price for your sin if he's not God, if he wasn't perfect? So it's very important. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful truth. Lord, we're only trying to grapple and scratch the surface in our understanding. And Lord, we, we, we have to say sometimes, who by searching can find out God? And yet, Lord, we are so glad this morning that you've revealed to us three in one on one in three. And we thank you this morning that the Trinity is at work 
for the good of all your people. So, Lord, help us to wait upon you, Father, and help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, what better hymn can we stand to sing than holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.